In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for His infinite love, mercy, and compassion, allowing us to be in His holy church, in His holy presence, and sharing His Word, which is the only truth ever to exist. The Holy Bible, where the Lord says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I pray that everyone who is present here in this holy church and everyone who is watching us through live streaming, that you're always in good health and in good spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If I could ask everyone to stand for the Lord's Prayer, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgave our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalm number 136. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. To him who by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. To him who struck Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endures forever. And brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endures forever. With a strong hand and with an outstretched arm for his mercy endures forever to him who divided the red sea in two for his mercy endures forever and made israel pass through the midst of it for his mercy endures forever but overthrew pharaoh and his army in the red sea for his mercy endures forever to him who led his people through the wilderness for his mercy endures forever to him who struck down great kings for his mercy endures forever, and slew famous kings, for his mercy endures forever, Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endures forever, and Og, king of Bashan, for his mercy endures forever, and gave their land as a heritage, for his mercy endures forever, a heritage to Israel his servant, for his mercy endures forever, who remembered us in our lowly state, for his mercy endures forever, and rescued us from our enemies. For his mercy endures forever, who gives food to all flesh. For his mercy endures forever, or give thanks to the God of heaven. For his mercy endures forever, and all glory be to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, a very good evening to everyone. How are we? Good. How are we? Good. How are we? Good. All right, all right. Well, I guess it's a Friday. It's been a long week. Everybody's probably tired and looking forward to going home and having a good um, restful night. But not when the bishop preaches. <laughs> you ain't going nowhere, brother. All right, very good. Before we start... Any new faces for the first time? A show of hands, if you don't mind. First time, wow, amazing, welcome, thank you, thank you. Where, about here, first time, yes, yes, put your hands together, yes, 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 over there, wonderful elves, I saw, I saw, our beautiful Armenian people, uh, shut love him, Baba, shut love him, shut, shut, very good, excellent. We thank the Lord for all the new faces, I pray uh, you continue to come. And those who are here regularly every Friday, God bless you for being so consistent in your um, 
pursuit of the truth and coming to hear the word of the one and only Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen? Amen. 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 Can't hear you. Amen. All right. Let's listen to this hymn and come back to our topic. Good. All right. So we are continuing our journey in the book of Revelation. And uh, today we'll be talking about a new chapter, which is chapter 21. We are approaching the um, the end of the book of Revelation, uh, and it's been just over two years now since we started. We did have a uh, few stops here and there, but uh, we are approaching the end of the book of Revelation. So today, it's the beginning of chapter 21, and we'll be reading one verse only, and we will not be commenting on the verse probably saying, what's going on, Bishop? So, okay. So, Revelation 21 and verse 1. Now, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea, and all glory be to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you very much for coming. (laughs) And I shall see you next week. Wonderful. So, okay, chapter 21. Well, last time we were talking um, about chapter 20, and we saw that chapter 20 spoke about how those people who rejected God, what kind of an end they had. So chapter 20 was about judgment, was about people that walked away from the Lord Jesus denied him till this very end, and then what were the consequences of that denial? And this goes for every human being, not only Christians, but for every human being, but more so to the Christians. Because those who believe and then reject the Lord at the end, their punishment will be much more severe than those who never believed initially or from the start. So those who rejected the Lord, we saw that they all ended up in the lake of fire and brimstone along with the devil, the beast, and the false prophets. All of them ended up in that lake of fire and brimstone. Now, and then chapter 20 finished with these words saying, and this is the second death. Now the second death we said, is when the spirit separates from its creator. When the spirit separates from God, that is the second death. The first death is when the spirit separates from the body, which is the physical, biological death, which every human being encounters that is born into this realm, into this world. But the second death is the real death, is the actual death that is forever when the spirit departs and separates from God, who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, in chapter 20, we saw the suffering of the people who did not choose God, and their end was fire. Chapter 21, after going through all that grim time, suffering, pain, agony, judgment, punishment, fire, you know, you feel kind of depressed hearing all these negative, negative, negative things. Well, after all this negativity, there has to be something positive. That's where chapter 21 and 22 come into play and speak entirely and totally about glory. No more pain, no more suffering, no more fire, no more punishment, no more judgment. So chapter 21 is the brighter side, is the positive side. After coming out of the dark tunnel, as they say, there is always the light at the end of the tunnel. Now, chapter 21 talks about how people will end up in glory. Now, who are these people that will end up in glory? Those who accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Blessed is the soul that believes in the Lord Jesus and hangs on to him till the end, till the very end. Blessed is that soul. Now, 
Here I would like to state something. Some Christians, whether through weakness or ignorance, say, where is God from all the suffering that is happening in the world? Where is he? What is he doing about it? Why we suffer? Why are we in pain? And how come God is not there when I really need him? I want him now. I cry out. I don't hear his voice immediately. Sometimes it takes years before he comes to my rescue. So Christians wonder, where is God in the midst of all this suffering and pain? But let me tell you this. When we get to that glory at the end in heaven, which chapter 21 and 22 speaks of, all which talks about chapter 21 especially that talks about everything will be made new see when we get to that heaven and we see that everything has been made anew we will realize that God had a reason why he allowed us to go through suffering we will realize then and then only fully why God allowed us to go through suffering and why he let us suffer where we cried out to him and he didn't come swiftly and rapidly and take, took us out of that suffering. No, he kept us in that suffering. We will realize why when we get to heaven fully. Now, we'll realize that God had a reason for it, for this suffering for us to endure and go through. And also we will realize that everything was under his control. Nothing was lost. You see, sometimes when we are truly struggling and we are going through some difficult, troublesome times, we think when the faith becomes extremely weak and tested to the ultimate, we think God has lost the grip. Is no longer in control and looks like things are really going haywire. Well, God is no longer there. Well, we'll realize that everything all along was under God's control. Nothing was lost. Nothing was going but according to God's will. Even when everything proved to us humans that Definitely it's not God's will, but we realize it was all along. In other words, when we make it to heaven, we will understand everything. Not everything here maybe, but definitely there. Definitely there. Now chapter 21 and 22 is the church of our Lord Jesus Christ in her glory. Chapter 21 and 22 is the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in her glory. When we go back to chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3 speaks about the church of our Lord Jesus Christ in her suffering and in her agony. So chapter 2 and 3, the church in her suffering. Chapter 21 and 22, the church in her glory. In her glory. Now, why does the church on earth need to suffer and endure all the tribulations and the persecutions that come against her from the world? Why? Now, in Romans 8, 17, St. Paul says, If indeed we suffer with him, meaning Jesus Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You see, without suffering, there is no glory. Without pain, there is no comfort. Without cry, tear, there is no laughter. And also in his epistle to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, he also says, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now, if we endure, we shall also reign with the Lord in his glory. 
And I always say this, Good Friday will always come before Sunday resurrection. Good Friday will always come before Sunday resurrection. You want Sunday resurrection, you need to go through Good Friday. It will never happen for anyone to skip Good Friday and only wishes to have Sunday resurrection. Well, Good Friday, suffering. Sunday resurrection, glory. Prior to glory, there must be pain and suffering. If we do not cry, we cannot laugh. Psalm 126.5, King David says, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy, my beloveds. Chapter 20 ends in suffering, pain, lake of fire. Therefore, chapter 21 and 22, all glory and comfort. He who endures till the end shall live. He who endures till the end shall live, my beloveds. But before we come to verse 1, which we won't be talking about today. <laughs> See, I'm trying to keep you as long as possible in the journey of revelation. So, um, before we come to verse 1, which God willing will come to it next Friday, I would like to draw your attention to verse 8 in the same chapter of today, 21. So let's put it on the screen and let's look at verse 8 in the same chapter. What does it say? But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now we said earlier that chapter 21 is all about glory, is all about comfort, is no longer punishment, no longer fire, no longer lake of fire, no longer brimstone, no longer pain. Well, how come in the same chapter comes back again and mentions the lake of fire and brimstone and the second death one more time? We said the lake of fire, brimstone, second death is for everyone who rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But chapter 21 says, talks about everyone who accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and they will end up in glory. Well, why do you talk about it in glory and then come back and talk about pain and agony in verse 8? And the chapter that talks about nothing but glory. Why mention the lake of fire again? Where is glory? Glory is in heaven. So chapter 21 talks about those who will end up in heaven. That's where glory is. Now... Since it's in heaven, then why talk about lake of fire and brimstone and second death again? Well, to answer this, John the Beloved, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the author of this Holy Bible, wishes to teach us the following, that God is love and justice. That God is love and justice and this is why we will not have a commentary on verse 1 because I'd like to talk to you about God being love and justice for the next you're not in a rush are you good I've just cancelled all your appointments for the remainder of the night and the weekend coming up very good so the Holy Bible is teaching us here that God is love and justice God with his love brought his church to glory God with his love brought his church to glory but God with his justice brought people to what is lawful brought people to what is lawful so God with his love brought his church 
to her glory, to his glory. But God with his justice brought people to what is lawful. In other words, when people accepted God, his love brought them to glory. But when people rejected God, his justice brought them to what is lawful and there is no escape from neither of the two. However, in both instances, God is glorified. In both instances, God is glorified. Let's have this simple scenario. Yeah, I like the rhythm. Yes, nice ringtone. That sounded like kind of Middle Eastern kind of a music. <laughs> Very nice, I like it. Um, let's take this scenario. Let's say there, in the entire world there is 100 people. Wow. Man, you'll have a lot of properties for free. <laughs> Let's say there is 100 people in this entire world. 30 of them believed in God and 70 of them rejected God. Now, if I were to ask you, what is the success rate of God here? Out of 100, 30 believed, 70 rejected. What is the success rate of God here? Who can tell me? Come on. You've, you've studied mathematics? 30%, isn't it? Absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. You see, some people will say, well, if 70 people out of the 100 were lost, then God looks like he failed. He should have saved the entire 100. He should have saved the entire hundred. So he, he only saved 30. He lost 70. Did God fail? Far from him. And the answer would be his, his success rate is 30% because he only saved 30 out of 100. But that's not the case. God will always be glorified 100%. In both cases. In the win and in the loss, he is glorified 100%. God is glorified 100% through his love. And God is also glorified 100% through his justice. It is all dependent on people under which banner they wish to place themselves. Do you wish to place yourself under the banner of God's love? Or do you wish to place yourself under the banner of God's justice? In both cases, God wins. In both cases, God is glorified. Either way, God is glorified. You see, if people choose willingly to place themselves under God's justice, what is justice? Law. It is the law of God. So if people place themselves under the law of God, which is justice, then no one will come out innocent. Everyone will be found guilty because nobody can stand in before God's justice and claim to be perfect or innocent. God's law will prove everyone they have sinned, made a mistake, and they committed a crime against God. So God's justice will find you guilty. And since he is the right just and he is the right judge and the only perfect judge. So when he judges, he is glorified in his judgment because nobody can argue against God's perfection, holiness and justice. No one. So when they place themselves under God's justice, the law of God, which is justice, will find them guilty. The result of that guilty verdict, they'll be sentenced all to the lake of fire and brimstone, eternal condemnation, eternal death. God is glorified because he's found the just judge. 
But if people choose willingly to place themselves under God's love, now what did come out of love? What came out of love? Grace and mercy. So if people choose willingly to put themselves under God's love, then they are under grace and mercy. Grace and mercy will take you to glory, which is eternal life, God's kingdom. You'll end up there. Grace and mercy will lead you to eternal life, God's kingdom, glory, my beloved, glory. You see now, <clears throat> God's attributes are all equal. So what do I mean by attributes? God is love, that is an attribute, love, justice, kindness, forgiveness, meekness, goodness, all these are attributes of God. Now, in all of his attributes, they're all equal, meaning love is not greater than justice, neither justice is greater than love. In other words, none of God's attributes can override the other. Love cannot override justice. Justice cannot override love because if there was an override in God's attributes, then there is contradiction in his nature, in his person. If, God's, if God contradicts himself, I cannot believe and trust in a God that changes his mind all the time. I cannot follow a God that switches from one thing to the other. Today he says one thing, tomorrow says another. The other day he comes with another word that overrides everything he said prior to it. I cannot believe, trust, and follow such a God. God must be the never changing, never, unable to change even if he tries to. Now this is what you call God. When he says one thing, it is forever. When he does one thing, it is forever. Because he is the never changing God. Never changing. If we were to say that God is love, and he created me based on love. But when I broke his word, he said, well, you broke my word. I don't love you anymore. If he was a God that changes. And if he were to come back and say, I don't love you anymore, we're in deep trouble. He will destroy us all. Now, how often do we say things and do opposite to what we say? How many times we make promises and we break those promises? How often have we said to God, I am coming back this time to you, Lord. I'll never walk away from you. This time I'm all yours. Before we even blink our eyes, we've already changed our mind and we've done totally opposite to what we promised two seconds ago. And if God was like us, good luck. Nobody would have stayed alive on earth from the word go. Everybody would have been killed by God and thrown in hell. But we thank God that he never changes. We thank God that he never changes. We thank God that he never changes. Um, But there is a problem in this as well. Because he never changes, there is an issue. God is facing a dilemma, if I may put it in a human level kind of an approach. When God created Adam, 
Now, you probably have heard this before, but Adam, we cannot say Adam a human being. Why? Because a human being in the Hebrew Aramaic language, we call him Bar Nasha. Bar Nasha. Now, Bar, Bar means the sun. Nasha, man. So, Bar Nasha means the son of man. See, the Lord Jesus, in the gospel according to Saint Matthew, he was referred to as the son of man. You will find this quite regularly mentioned in Matthew, the son of man, the son of man, the son of man. The son of man meaning he came from another man, another human being, another person. But Adam came from the hands of God. Adam did not come from another human. Adam came from the hands of God. Therefore, Adam is God's creation, not Bar Nasha, son of man. Adam is God's creation. He came from God directly. Now, when God created Adam, the reason why God created Adam, as the Holy Bible tells us and teaches us, he created him on the basis of love. On the basis of love. Now, since God is love, he created Adam and everything visible and invisible, both physical and spiritual realms, everything God created with love. Angels, heavens, galaxies, universe, humanity, all creations, animals, plants, birds, you name it. Everything was created based on love. But there is a difference between the human race and every other creation of God's. The only creation out of the entire creations of God's that has the image and the likeness of God is the human race. The only. Angels not like humans. Angels are not. And let me add to this and go furthermore. The only creation out of all God's creations, both spiritual and physical realms, that were created from within, not from without God, is the human race. When God created Adam, the book of Genesis says that God breathed, he breathed into Adam the breath of life. He breathed. Where did this breath come? From within. Not from without of God, from within. That breath of life came from inside of God and out when he breathed into the nostrils of Adam. And then the Holy Bible says, and Adam became a living soul. We have a spirit, we have a body, but we don't have a soul for we are a soul. So we came from within of God. This is why he said to Adam, he is created in my image according to my likeness. In my image according to my likeness. Now image in the original text means icon, not picture. And this is where some Christians get it wrong. And they say, why do you have pictures in the church? It is wrong because God said to Moses, do not create or carve anything and then bow down and worship them. I say to people as such, with love and respect, did God become a man or not? If you say no as a Christian, you're in deep trouble. Well, since God became a man, then did God have an image? 
They can't say no. So that's why I put an image in the church, not a picture. And it is thus quite okay to have that image or that icon in the church symbolically representing the Lord Jesus as a Chinese, as an African, as a European, as a Middle Eastern, American, Canadian, you name it. Why? Because the image is not the picture. Now, if I refer to this icon as a picture, then does Jesus look like this? No, I don't know. Well, I know, but you know what I mean. But he doesn't look like this one. He doesn't. Even though it's beautiful. But he doesn't look like 100%. Why? Because this is not a picture. When I take a picture of a person, that picture is what they look like exactly from outside. That picture looks is exactly them from outside. You take a photo of someone, this is how they look like in the real life. This is them. It's representing the person from outside. The image is an internal look, not an external one. So image means invisible, likeness means visible, external. So God created this human race, Adam, and he's called him my image according to my likeness. Image internally, likeness externally. And the word likeness, when you read it in the Greek text, it talks about a dummy, doll, dummy. And what is a dummy? Statue. So God created the human being internally and externally. Internally icon, externally statue. Even though this is not our topic, but I had to mention it along the way. If I bring someone far from all of you and those who do not see, I pray they see again. And the next time their eyes are open, they see the Lord Jesus. There is no other beauty than him. If I bring someone who is blind and then I put two icons, two pictures for the sake of argument before them and I say, Put your hand on these two icons and tell me which is a male, which is a female. They will not be able to differentiate. But if I bring two statues and I say to this blind person, put your hand on this statue and on this one, tell me which is a male, which is a female, they will be able to differentiate between the two. Because a icon is internal, invisible, but the statue dummy likeness of God is the statue. Statue is the external looks which is visible to the physical realm. So let me put it this way. Love. What is love? Icon. Internal image that is invisible. When will this love be visible? When I put it into an act a deed, when I do something based on love, I've revealed to the other person that I love them by doing some sort of an act which reflected the invisible image called love. That love became transfigured. When the love became transfigured in that deed, that love became a statue, tangible, visible, and I realized this person loves me. But I never knew they loved me. Why? Because love in its nature is an image, internal, invisible. It became visible when it became a statue, tangible, through a deed. Now God put Adam in the Garden of Eden, which a lot of, or most of theologians, scholars, and say it's in north of Iraq, where I come from. Go Iraq, baby. Go Mesopotamia, baby. The land of the Tigris and the Euphrates, the cradle of civilization. 
Now, he put him in the Garden of Eden. And he said, Adam, I'm going to give you three choices. Why? Because since I created you on the basis of love, and since you don't know me, I have to teach you that I exist, and I am the reason for your existence. And now you need to learn who this God, who is all love, by putting you in this garden and teaching you that I loved you. That's why I created you. So he said, Adam, since I love you, I'm going to have to give you choices. Why? Because you are my image and my likeness. Since you're my image and likeness, you're my son. And since you are the son, the son cannot be the son unless they are free in their father's house. What is associated with the son is freedom. The moment you take freedom from the son, the son becomes a slave. Straight away. And the moment they are slaves, no longer sons. And the moment they are no longer sons, no longer inheritors, no longer heirs to the throne. They're dead, finished. So those people who say that we are slaves of God, they have doomed themselves to eternal condemnation. Unless you are the child of God, you have no hope. No hope. So God said, you're my son, Adam. And I created you on the basis of love. I put you in the Garden of Eden. And since you're the son, you are free. And since you're free, I have to allow you to taste and live this freedom by giving you options, not one, but options for you to choose in order to live your freedom, enjoy your freedom based on love. So Adam, there are three kinds of trees. There is one in the heart of the garden called the tree of life. That is my beloved son, the only begotten. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the tree of life. Now the tree of life is the Lord Jesus. You need to understand how the Holy Bible talks. Adam, there is another tree also called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That tree is you, all of us. We are the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And there is other trees over there, Adam. They are for your physical nourishment. If you don't eat, you're going to die. You have a physical body. It needs physical food. So I've put you physical trees to feed the physical body, lest that body dies. The trees you are free to eat from. The tree of life, which is my son, you are free to eat from. But the day... You eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Surely you shall die. Don't ever eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now that tree is Adam who is every human being. Not Christians only. Every human being. We are that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said the day you eat, meaning the day you rely on yourself... The day you do it your way, not God's way, your beginning is good, but your end is 100% evil. People that choose to live on earth their way, not God's, they start good, but their end is absolutely destructive. Young men and young women, my sons and daughters, you're still living at home under the banner of mom and dad parenthood when you are disobedient to your parents when you do things your way and disregard every other person above you your beginning is a laughter your end is tears non-stop non-stop 100 percent stamp sealed delivered to your doorstep you cannot escape this. Impossible. You know why? Because there is one in heaven called our Father who art in heaven. There is our parent in heaven that makes sure this law will always be done. So, you do it your way. It's fun. It's good. And this teenage boy for the first time is released from the cage called home. 
And he's sitting in this car with five other mates. And they have the biggest Sabufa Habibi in the back seat. And it goes. And everybody's. They've gone deaf. It's so loud. They're cruising down the freeway, going downtown. And the word down, it means failure. You're going down, brother. That's a failure. You need to go up in order to succeed, not down. So next time somebody gets, says to you, let's go downtown, say, mate, you go. I'm, not, I'm going uptown. Downtown is hell. Uptown is heaven. Downtown is Satan. Uptown is Jesus Christ. Downtown is darkness. Uptown is light. Downtown is death. Uptown is life. Downtown is a lie. Uptown is the truth. Choose. The Lord God says in the book of Isaiah, I have put before you two paths. One is life and one is death. Choose life in order to live. Choose life. Simple. Don't complicate things. If you choose the path of death, and whatever happens to you, why are you shocked? Why do you come back and blame God? God, what are you doing to me? Why am I in trouble? Excuse me, you chose death, you'll die. You chose darkness, you're done, you're finished. Don't blame no one but you. Don't blame no one but you. Adam, the day you rely on yourself, not your God, the beginning is good, but the end is evil, death, destruction. Now, Adam, there is a problem here. Since I am the never-changing God, which I'll come back to our topic now, since I'm the never-changing God, you see, my love, Adam, is not greater than my justice. My justice is not greater than love. I can't override in any of my attributes. They're all equal. This is my problem. So, Adam, you need to be very, very careful in what I say to you. You need to follow through with what I say because what I say decides your eternity. Eternity forever. Adam, if you don't listen to me and you break my word, surely, surely means definitely. There is no two ways about it. There is no escape from it. You will die 100% if you don't listen to me. Now, I'm saying it to you, Adam, out of love. Not out of putting fear in you. I'm not a dictator. I'm your dad. For dad's sake. I'm your dad. And there is no father that wishes harm for his own child. Impossible. 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 You will impose that harm on yourself as a father and will never allow it to happen to your child. Never. When we're talking about true, true parenthood. True parenthood. Now, Adam, listen to what I'm saying. Whatever you do, don't break my word. What did Adam do? The first thing he did, broke God's word. <laughs> See, this is the problem. If we say, why couldn't God just create everything and just make it perfect? Why couldn't he just create us all and put us in heaven and get on with it? That's it, done. Well, the problem is, since everything is created based on love, then with love, nothing is forcible. Nothing is forcible. I cannot say to someone, I love you, and I suffocate them 24-7. I cannot say, I love someone, and I don't let them even breathe. I cannot say, I love someone, and I don't even let them talk, express their opinions. You know, give out their, uh, what, the right, the freedom of speech, which government is trying to impose on us under the banner of misinformation. 
Government, you're not God. And if you try to be one, God who art in heaven will fix you and will show you what kind of a being you are. You're a piece of dust. God can wipe you before you blink your eyes, even if you're a government. No one is above the law of God. No one. No one. And anyone who tries must fall. Must. This is the justice of God. <laughs> he's perfect. It's a problem. He's perfect. It's a problem for us. Now, wherever there is true love, there must be freedom. There must be choices. And since there is choices, there must be the will to be able to choose. The will is the tool that enables every human being to say yes or to say no, even to God, even to God. Now love, there is something else to it. Since love cannot be separated from freedom, or I should say freedom is indispensable to love. Freedom cannot be separated from love. Therefore love is not mandatory, it is a choice. It is a choice. You choose to love, you're not forced to love. The moment you are forced to love, you never love. You cannot love forcefully. It has to come willingly. Then it is love, true love. When it is done willingly, when you do it willingly, that means you are doing it freely. You chose to love. Nobody forced you. And we find this more exemplified in the marriage union. The priest, first thing he'll come and ask the couple, do you? Choose to marry this girl and ruin your life forever. Yes, Father. Do you, my daughter, listen to what I'm saying, daughter. Do you choose freely to give yourself to this man? Ash on your head, Qutma Brisho. Choose your, your, yourself to give to this man freely. Really? Are you sure? Yes, Father. If you come after today and you say, Father, I want to divorce, I will bury both of you. <laughs> Go home. It's a choice. I chose to come and get married on the day. Nobody forced me. Nobody forced me. I came, to, I came willingly. Now, this is where the dilemma is. God is love. Everything he created based on love. And since it is true love, there has to be freedom. There has to be choices. There has to be a will to decide willingly, freely, choosing whatever you wish to choose because you're free. Because there is love. That's a problem. You see, love on its own is a problem. It's a headache. <laughs> you were absolutely fine every morning you woke up, you had your head screwed in the right place. You knew exactly what you were going to do every day, in and out. You wash your face, you brush your teeth, you put on your a work outfit and you and you go to your daily you know schedule the moment you fall in love you wake up you go out in your pajamas your hair is being electrocuted you ha you forgot to wash your face to eat you can't eat anymore you can't sleep anymore you're gone you're ruined why why do you look like a zombie? Oh, I'm in love. Oh. 
You look so chic, bro. So well dressed. Now you're all over the place. Love ruins. But the problem is, love is the only thing you cannot live without. <laughs> Honestly, it's a funny story, but it's the truth. Love is the only thing in existence that you cannot live without. See, the problem, the moment love is taken entirely, what is left is hell. Everything becomes hell. You could be the richest man on earth, the wealthiest man on earth, the smartest man on earth, the strongest man on earth. When you are lacking love, everything is hell. But when you are the poorest on earth, and you have a very humble shelter you live in, but there is love in that shelter, that is your wealth, your kingdom, your everything. What makes you and breaks you is love. What makes you and breaks you is love. Nothing else. Nothing else. Love. This is why in Christianity, the only place, the only place where love precedes life is found in Christianity. With all love and respect, you ask all the religions that are out there in the world, they will tell you life precedes love. Wrong. Because if life preceded love, what would you have done with a life that had no love in it? It would have been an absolute hell. What makes life, life is love. That's why the Holy Bible tells us that God is a life giver. But God is not a love giver. God is love, not a giver. He is love itself. And this is why love is the supreme ethic. Supreme ethic. So now, God is love. Created Adam on the basis of love. With love there is freedom. With freedom choices. With choices will. Adam, you can eat from these trees. But this one, the moment you eat, you're dead. Adam ate, died. Now this is why in Revelation 21, since it's talking about the glory of those who are, who are going to make it to heaven and they live in glory, but in the midst of that glory, he mentions verse 8 about the second death. Why are you mentioning something that doesn't belong to heaven? Heaven is all life, eternal life. Why are you mentioning second death? Because he's saying, God is saying to all of us, I want you to realize this about me. I am love but also justice. Be careful. And since my love is not greater than justice or vice versa, you need to be very cautious on how you listen to my directives. Now, Adam, you break my word, you have to die. You know why you have to die? Because my justice will come into play. Now my justice says, the only way for any human being to live is if they fulfill my law. The only way for any human, any human, not Christians, any human, for any human being to live, they must fulfill my law. Now my law is justice. And my justice says, you break my law, my law breaks you. You break my word, my word will come back and judge you. And when my word judges you, you will be found guilty 100%. And the result of this guilty verdict, only eternal death, the second death awaits you. There is no escape. But since I am love, I created you to live, not to die. So now you broke my word. My love is crying out 
for you come back but my justice says to my love hang on a sec he broke the law the law must break him but God is saying now but he's my son I want him back but my justice is saying he needs to be punished and I can't override my justice with my love because then I am a contradicting God and it is impossible because I am perfect in every attribute of mine they're all equal so now I'm stuck with my love I'm crying out to you humanity and with my justice is saying they all have to be condemned to the second death eternal death what do we do grace came into play uh, do you have time <laughs> see I'm just warming up <laughs> grace I'll read Psalm 85 10 look at the Holy Bible incredible Psalm 85 10 King David says the following it's not on the screen mercy and truth have met together righteousness and peace have kissed mercy mercy and truth have met together righteousness and peace have kissed what is mercy love what is truth justice what is mercy love and what is truth justice what is justice everything that is true isn't it a lie is not justice everything that is truthful is justice this is why even in the human judicial system there is no justice because justice is only found in its totality and perfection with God many but with God there is equality and fairness no one is judged incorrectly because you are before the perfect judge and the perfect law King David is saying mercy and truth love and justice have met together never because love is totally opposite to justice and justice is totally opposite to love when I'm sitting in a car and I'm driving a hundred K in a 60 zone and there is the police officer sitting in that car hiding with the radar on and Mr. Khabibi is flying and Mr. Khabibi is flying because he's listening to what a, what a dov dov and he is over the moon and he's cruising down the highway Danny and he's cruising down the highway and the radar picks him up and pulls him over and comes to Danny says pull your window down I got you on the radar doing a hundred K in a 60 zone do you have anything to say and whatever you say let me remind you you see this camera it's got a microphone and everything you say is recorded and it goes to the head office even if I wish to let you go I can't it's recorded during lockdown I came one Sunday morning you know and everything was locked to celebrate the Holy Mass and I see three police officers in the church they came out while before getting into the front door Bishop Bishop the police are here I said who cares so what we're not doing anything wrong where are they anyway we went and spoke to them I was very upset because we received hundreds of phone calls like in a very short time people crying over the phone Bishop I don't know what to do I don't want to get the jab but if I don't get it they're not letting me go to work I've got a family to feed so I was upset so I came and I spoke a little bit with a high pitch that's how I'm going, how I'm going to put it, high pitch. And then, and then after that, I said to that officer, I said, look, it's nothing to do with you. 
It's just I'm not recognizing this country anymore. You are enslaving people. Stop doing this to people. That officer said, Bishop, I'm reminding you, you are on camera and it's being recorded, it's going to head office. I said, I want them to hear this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did that. I want them to hear this. So they went out, came back. They said, okay, Bishop, we're going. I said, good. Please join us. And don't put the mask on because there is no corona. Here we drive Lexus, baby. But we don't want Lexus. I want a Holden Commodore V8, mate. The good old V8. It's a shame that they closed the Ford and the, and the Commodores, mate. The best vehicles. The V8s. Anyway. So where was I? Yes. Hmm? Justice and love. Yes. That's where we are. King David says mercy and truth got met together. Justice and love. Now, when the police officer pulled Danny over and said, I got you on the radar doing 160, what are you going to say? Can't say anything. Now, Danny, being a nice boy, is going to say, officer, please, officer, I swear on your head, officer, I, did, I was speeding because, you know, my mother cooked for me dolma and I had to rush into the house to eat dolma. Please, officer, I beg you, officer, you, you seem to be a nice officer. You've got a heart that is beautiful, gold heart, gold heart. Can you please let me go, officer? The officer will say to him in chap, be quiet. That was an Iraqi. Be quiet. You cannot get away by begging. Why? You cannot ask for mercy when you're talking about justice. <laughs> you see, what pulled me over was the law. And in the law, there is no love, there is no mercy, there is nothing. The law knows one thing. You broke it, will break you. You were speeding, Here's the ticket, you lose three points, whatever, and here's $300 fine for you. See you later. What do you mean, please, I love you? Yeah, what love you? You love me, I love you, it means nothing. It's justice here. It is justice. You broke the law, the law will break you. So you see, the problem with justice, there is no mercy. But King David says, mercy and truth, which is justice, met together. Two parallel lines that cannot meet, they met together. This was only made possible at one moment in history over 2,000 years ago called Calvary the Cross. On the cross on Calvary, that's where mercy and justice truth ever met once and for all. It can never happen anywhere else. Only on the cross. Only on the cross. See, that's where Jesus Christ is the sole and only savior and redeemer of the entire world. If people think Jesus is related to Christians, you haven't understood anything. Jesus is God. He relates to everyone. He came to save everyone, every single human being. Now, under the misinformation bill, if it's passed, I can't say this because they will say this is misinformation. Mr. Labor, I'll sentence you to hard labor if you don't sit and be a good boy. Jesus Christ is the only one. Now, you see, like mercy, the source of mercy is love. But the problem with love on its own cannot save because justice is standing in its way. You see, out of love I created you, God is saying. 
But when you broke my word, my justice has to be fulfilled. I can't stop it. That's why I warned you, Adam. I pre-warned you. Don't eat from this tree. Now, when I said it, what did I say? A set of laws. What is law word? And that word, when you put it together, becomes law. So when I said to you, Adam, do not eat, that became a law. When you ate, you broke my law. My law must be fulfilled. And my law says the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23. When you break my law, it's called sin. And the wages of sin is death. Now, Adam, you're dead. But I created you on the basis of love. And with love, I gave you life. I never created you to die. It is contradictive to my own creation. And since I'm the never changing God, I can't create something and give it life in order to die. Impossible. Impossible. So what do I need to do? My love is crying out, not good enough. My justice says must be punished. If I save Adam based on love, I've broken my justice. And if I judge Adam based on justice, I've broken my love. Both ways, God is in trouble. May God forgive me for saying this. So, but will God stop? No. I love you. So to bring you out of love, I'm breaking justice. To judge you, I'm breaking my love. I can't win with neither of them. So I came up with something called grace grace now what is grace grace is a gift given freely to someone unworthy of it let me say that again grace is a gift given by God freely to someone unworthy of it and what was the gift of God to the human race Jesus Christ of Nazareth his beloved and only begotten son. Jesus Christ became the grace of God for the entire human race. Where he came and said, my dad is love. And this love sent me to be the grace to the entire human race. So when, uh, when, King David in, 80, in Psalm 85 10 says mercy and truth met together he is talking about Jesus Christ being crucified because the only way for mercy and truth justice to embrace one another Jesus Christ had to be that sacrifice now the Lord Jesus came to be the grace of God a gift given for free to unworthy people. Not worthy of it. So the Lord came and said, the Lord, by the way, he spoke with his dad, not with us. It's a long story. You see, it's a covenant between the Father and the Son, the New Testament. The Old Testament is a covenant between God and Israel. Men failed. But this New Testament covenant, it being between the Father and the Son. That's why when it's the Father and the Son, it never fails. When does it fail? When we stick our noses where it doesn't belong. When we try to be Jesus. <laughs> you stay as you are, leave the Father and the Son, work it out together. They never fail. So now the Son came, Jesus Christ, as the grace of God to the human race. He said, Dad, yes, son, you love me, right? You are my only love, son. But you created the human race based on this love. Yes, Dad, yes, son. But the human race broke your word, and they are all being punished by your justice to go into eternal death. Correct, son. But since you love, you can't see them going to eternal death, the second death. Correct, son. So now I'm coming to save the human race for you, Dad, in order to come back to you once again. Correct, son. What will it take, Dad, to save the human race? He said, son, you have to die on their behalf. 
You have to die on their behalf. You have to die on their behalf. Now, when God said to Adam, the day you break my word, surely you shall die. So who woken up that death to come and engulf us and swallow us? God. God gave the order for death to wake up. The moment we broke his word, God commanded for death to get up and devour us. And since the order came from God for death to conquer those who sin, no one can stop death now. Even the greatest scientists and the medical field advancement, they can't do anything about death. They come up with these pills, with you know, organic stuff, ironing the face, stretching others, doing laser, doing this, Botox, you're gonna die. They take herbal stuff, they take these vitamin, I don't know what, they, maybe some aliens brought it from some <laughs> imaginary planet, nonsense. Oh, we live. Well, if you think you live for 100, 200, 300 years, somebody lived before you a long time ago, 969 years, and he is rotted in the grave. Methuselah lived for 969 years. So, sorry, elites. You lose. Everybody dies. Everybody dies. It's a law of God. It's an order given by God. No one can stop what God begins. So the Lord says to his dad, well, so I die on their behalf. Yes. Now that's called grace. A gift given for free to unworthy people. The holy one dying for the sinful one like me. So when the Lord came, what did he become? The latter Adam. The former Adam failed, the latter Adam succeeded. The former Adam stretched his hand to the tree and ate from the forbidden tree. The latter Adam stretched his hand to the tree of the cross and fulfilled God's law to the core, to the fullness. He stretched his arm not to take from the tree, but to be nailed to the tree. That's why he was crucified on a piece of wood representing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was a tree, wood, because Adam failed through a tree. The latter Adam succeeded through a tree called the cross. So when he stretched his arm, he fulfilled God's law. Now God's justice is being fulfilled. Adam must die. The latter Adam, Jesus, died. Justice is fulfilled. But the Lord Jesus said one thing, Dad, when I die, will you ask me to die again? God said, when I said to the former Adam, if you eat from the forbidden tree, surely you shall die. I asked of him to die once, never to die again. So I will never ask from a human being to die again. So Jesus said, if I die now and I rise from the dead, you're not going to ask me to die again, are you? He said, no, I've asked for death once. And since I'm God, they're never changing. I will only ask it once and once only forever. And the Lord said, okay, dad, I will die on the cross for carrying the human race sins. But I will rise from the dead because I never committed sin. I only carried the sins of others. But I myself never sinned as a human being. Therefore, death can only have control over sinners. Sin, uh, since I am sinless, Jesus, the Son of Man, since I am sinless, death has no authority over me. I died because I carried the sins of the world, but I will rise because I, Jesus, never sinned as a human. I am the sinless Lamb of God. 
therefore I will rise from the dead. When I rise dead, I'll never die again. Now, whoever accepts me as Lord and Savior, they will not be asked to die again by you, God. True? God said yes. True. He who has the Son has eternal life. Those who place themselves under the banner of God's love, grace and mercy carried them to glory, the heaven of all heavens, eternity, to live forever. And those who place themselves willingly under the justice of God's law, they were condemned to the lake of fire and brimstone, eternal death, the second death. Since Jesus never sinned, he cannot die, but he was carrying our sins. For carrying them, he died once, but for not sinning himself, he had to rise. Because death can only hold sinners in grave, not sinless. That's why the tomb of the Lord is empty. It's a simple mathematical equation. When you believe in Jesus Christ of Nazareth, when you hold on to the Lord Jesus, when you entrust him with all of you, all of you, when you entrust him with it, you cannot die. Impossible. Why? Because God is the never-changing God. He will never change his mind about you. He will never change his word about you. And he will never change his promise. I am with you all the days of your life and, and until the end of all ages. When you trust in the Lord Jesus, he is with you always and forevermore. And the Lord Jesus is God revealed in the flesh. As God, he cannot go back on his word. God is love and justice. That's why Jesus had to be the grace of God. Because humanity broke God's word. Justice had to be served. You've got to die. But his love says, I created you to live. Two parallel lines can't meet. Grace embraced mercy and justice together on the cross. He died on our behalf. To fulfill God's justice, the wages of sin is death. He died and he rose from the dead because he never sinned. He will never be asked to die again. So when you say to Jesus, I make you my Lord and Savior, you will live for as long as the sun lives. Jesus is the only way. He's the only way. And what a way he is. But I'll leave you with this, and I know I've taken so long. <laughs> Let me tell you this very quickly. Is it cold? Yes, it's, it's cold, maybe half a degree warm it up. You see, the problem, my beloveds, with love, there will always be pain. Always. On earth, not in heaven, but on earth, there will always be pain. You know why? Because who can define love, let alone live it fully? You see, love is one of those absolutes. There are many absolutes in life, but there are four foundational absolutes in life that no one can ever fully define or fully illustrate. What are the four? Love, justice, evil, forgiveness. Love, justice, evilness, forgiveness. These four, no one can fully define nor illustrate fully. But the four were fully converged together, fully defined and illustrated on the cross on Calvary. From the cross, God the Father cried out and said, I am love. 
And since I loved you, I created you. The day you broke my word, you broke my heart. My life cried out because you broke my word, you broke my heart. And since you broke my word, you broke my heart. I sent you my son to die on your behalf since I love you more than me. I sent my only son to die on your behalf. When my son died, he said, Dad, your justice is fulfilled. The wages of sin is death. I died on their behalf. Are you happy now? He said, yes. But then the Lord says, Dad, my blood which I shed on Calvary washed away the evilness of everyone who accepted me as Lord and Savior. And since I washed their sins clean, I cried out from the cross to you, Dad, and said, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Love, justice, evil, forgiveness were fully defined, illustrated by Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is the grace of God to the entire human race, the only savior and the only redeemer, the only way, the only truth, and the only eternal life, no one else but him. And we'll continue verse 1. <laughs> next Friday, God willing. So stay with verse 1 for next Friday. You know, we need to come back to the Lord Jesus from the heart. Because love is to do with your heart. Not your mind, your heart. You choose your friend with your head, but you choose your partner in marriage with your heart first, then your head. If you choose your partner with your head in marriage, you will always live in pain. If love was not the first thing in choosing your partner in marriage, the head will be tired for the rest of its life. But you see, good luck to you, my dear child when you choose at the beginning it's the heart and the heart is dumb <laughs> oh I love him I love him I can't live without him if I don't marry him I'm gonna hang myself well please be my guest would you like me to provide you a rope from Bunnings <laughs> And then after marriage, and after honeymoon, after one year, the heart starts to uh, going numb numb, you know, like goes to sleep. And then the mind wakes up and says, Lord have mercy, what have I done? <laughs> I was blind. How did I choose this gorilla to marry? <laughs> but this gorilla, when the heart looked at it, saw it as a rosella and a gazelle baby. <laughs> you know? But the mind says, no, it's a gorilla. <laughs> RSPCA, please come to my rescue. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just kidding. <clears throat> if you're married, tough luck, too late. If you're single, please never get married. Uh, I mean, I wish you all the best. <laughs> Very good, very good. The Lord Jesus is the only one, the only one. Build your relationship with the Lord if you haven't yet. Today, tonight, this moment, say, Lord, I'm too tired. I've been doing it my way for too long, and all I got, pain, suffering, agony, lost, confused, empty, destroyed. Lord, you know what? I give up. I'm waving the white flag. I'm surrendering. I'm coming to you wholeheartedly from head to toe, inside and out. All of me. Nothing. I reserve nothing. I leave behind nothing. All of me I give to you, Lord. I'm asking you. I'm begging you, Lord. Take control. Full control of me. Because me is nothing but pain. Cause me a lot of dramas. A lot of mischief. Wrong decisions, left, right, and center. I've had enough. I want to live in peace and in silence. I don't want to cry anymore. I don't want to be angry anymore. I don't want to lose it anymore. I don't want to be agitated. I want to find peace.
peace, Lord. Help me, I beg you. Take over. I surrender. The rest is history. Amen. Amen. We thank you, Lord. Very good. Now, a couple of announcements, and um, and then we call it a day. Um, I'm going to start with this misinformation, uh, and I want every every Aussie and every human being. With a, with a clear conscience to, to see what is happening in our time and age. This misinformation bill, um, we emailed the appropriate departments in regard to this, that we wanted to have a fair go at this and, and present our case, why we are against the misinformation bill. I'm not a politician. I will never, ever try to be one. It's not my path. And I'm saying it with love and respect to everyone who is a politician. God, our Lord, Jesus Christ, chooses our path and everybody gets a profession in this life. Politics is not my field. Never has been, never will be. But when it comes to human rights to human freedom of speech and religion, then we all have the right to say and express our concerns. So we wrote to them on the 8th of October. Um, <clears throat> an email came back, and that email said, it requests the bishop to attend public hearing Thursday, October the 17th, in person or by Zoom meeting. That was on the 8th of October, we received an email saying that the bishop can attend a public hearing on Thursday, October the 17th, in person in Canberra uh, or by Zoom meeting. On the 11th of October, Friday, our secretary acknowledged the receipt of this email. And then on Friday, um, sorry, on Thursday, and then on Friday the 12th, the email went saying, the bishop now accepts the invitation, but will attend online. I requested to attend it online rather than in person. On Monday, the 14th of October, at 1.34 p.m., an email came from the government requesting for the bishop to attend a 10 a.m. sitting alongside with Australian Christian Lobby and the Uniting Church, because there was other groups that opposed this misinformation bill. I didn't choose who to sit with. All I said, I'm sending it. I just want you to give me a fair go. And then on Monday, the same day, at 3.40 p.m., an email came with a change of time from 10 a.m. to 2.40 p.m., which we accepted on Tuesday the 15th at 1.29 p.m. On Tuesday at 1.51 p.m., a text was sent to the bishop secretary requesting another meeting change. The time changed from 2.40 to 5.05 p.m. And the bishop accepted the change. And he said, yes, we agree. We agree. And then on Tuesday, 1.53 p.m., a text confirming change. Okay, we will check with the chair of the committee and get back to you ASAP. I assume video conference response was, yes, please just do it. Since Tuesday the 15th of October at 1.53 p.m., that was the last text message coming from the government to us. Everything went hush, hush, quiet. There was no email, no calls, no text, nothing about what was given to us back on the 8th of October that yes, we can attend a public hearing either in person or a Zoom call. Since the, fifth, uh, the Tuesday the 15th at 1.53 p.m., which by now they've changed the time three times. And there was nothing heard until we wrote to them in November saying, what's going on? 
We received a reply on Tuesday, the 12th of November, 2024, at 9.54 a.m., saying, Dear so-and-so, My apologies for not informing you earlier. Due to timing constraints and the level of interest in this inquiry, the committee unfortunately did not include Bishop Murray on this hearing program. The committee has, however, considered and expressed its thanks for your submission. Uh, So uh, this is what I say to the Labour Party. Is this the way you're, you're represent, you represent this great nation of Australia? Is this the way you represent a nation that was built on, on, on absolute moral ethics values, Christian values? And not only that, and also at a human level where you, you always fought for human rights, democracy, and freedom of speech, and freedom of religion. Is this the way you treat an Australian citizen? Is it, Labour Party? I believe this is a very shameful tactic and a very shameful behaviour from a government that represents a great nation called Australia and the people of Australia. Now, go the Aussies. I, I, honestly, this is an embarrassment to this government. An absolute embarrassment. Now, you're telling me you speak freedom and you're talking about the misinformation bill? Wasn't this misinformation in its core? Now, as a government, if you, if you have failed, which you have terribly in this instance, where you have failed to preserve and protect the, the, the citizens of this nation for their freedom of speech and freedom of religion, then you are not qualified to be a government. You need to step down, all of you. All of you. And I say this to the opposition leader, the Honorable Peter Dutton. What are you going to do about this as the opposition leader? Are you going to be quiet about this? Or are you going to take it and fight for it till the, till the end? Because that, for me, is absolutely an embarrassment. An absolute embarrassment. It's very embarrassing. So now, Bishop, you can come at 10 a.m. Okay. Oh, no, sorry. You can come at uh, 2.40 p.m. Okay. No, no. So you can come now at 5 or 5 p.m. Okay. And then it goes quiet. Drum roll. A couple of weeks later. Sorry. There was a lot of interest into this. Since we had a lot of time constraints, we chose not to pick Bishop Murray. Man, I'm the best looking bishop. <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was going to buy a fish burger and a chocolate sundae for all committee members in this whatever hearing was. And I was going to say, mate, hey, just relax. Happy meal. Yeah, happy meal, yeah. <laughs> it's no longer happy now. <laughs> <It's>, um, <laughs> I'm going to give them all, I'm going to serve them all the sad meal. <laughs> and no chocolate sundae. Just leave this nonsense alone. I just want to know one thing. Who are you and who gave you the authority, the permission to be the definers of what is misinformation? Can you define for me? Can you specify for me what is misinformation? And then when you categorize it in whatever categories you're putting it, who gives you the right? Who are you? Who are you to say, what people say now is misinformed or disinformed. Who are you? Look, it is only God and God alone that can say what you can say or not. Even God is not restraining us 
for you to come as a government and say to us, we can't say it now because you fall under the misinformation bill, therefore we're going to block you. Lord, I pray from the bottom of my heart, not for anything, but for your holy name to be glorified this moment. Lord, may you show every government that is trying to impose evil agendas on the human race, may you put them to shame. May you, may you rebuke them like you rebuke that wild ocean. May you teach them a lesson that they are nothing but a piece of dust enough playing God because they are absolutely false gods. There is only one true living God who art in heaven and his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is the only true living God. So enough of this nonsense and enough of this childish behavior from adults mature called government. Enough. So the, before the bill is passed, and I pray it never goes to that level, you've just destroyed this bill yourselves <laughs> because that was a lot of misinformation disclosed to us, dear government or committee members. Plenty of misinformation. So what kind of misinformation are you talking about? You know what? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sue you now because you've misinformed me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to call Google and I'm going to shut the government down. Honestly, what a joke. What a joke. Seriously, man. Like, there is so many problems we are facing. Look what they're busy with. Seriously, are you Are you serious? Like not even kids that will act like this. Not even kids. So grow up. Misinformation, disinformation, box information. <laughs> well, I know one thing. This whole country has to be given back to the natives. Our beloved Aborigines. And that's, that, that country belongs to them. So if you're talking about misinformation, there you have misinformed everyone. The country needs to go back to the, to the rightful owners who are the Aboriginal people, our beloved Aborigines. So government, get out, go back to Great Britain and leave Australia to the, to the true Aussies, the Aborigines. Yeah, that's it. And all of us, we need to go back to our own countries and leave it to other Aborigines. That's it. So what misinformation? So this is how you treat us. Thank you very much. Thanks for nothing. Labor Party. Uh, what a great Labor Party this is. All right, now, okay. Now, that was the misinformation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Incredible. Now, just to cut it very, very short, uh, don't forget this Sunday we are ordaining 12 young men to be, in, be uh, deacons and serve in the house of the Lord. Please, it's open to everyone. Um, you can join us this Sunday at 9 a.m. During the Holy Mass service in the morning at 9 a.m., we'll be ordaining 12 young men uh, to serve in the house of the Lord. So uh, congratulations to all those 12 young men. And uh, well done to the parents who have encouraged them to go forth and support their sons to take this big step in their life. So well done, mom and dad. Well done. Um, the last thing is, uh, oh, not the last, before the last, our Christmas carols for this year will be held on Saturday, the 7th of December at 3 p.m. It'll start at 3. So Saturday, the 7th of December at 3 p.m. Um, so please, it's open for everyone, mom and dads with babies and prams, young and old, everyone. You're more than welcome to come and join us on Saturday, the 7th of December, starting at 3 p.m. Christmas carols for this year. Uh, lastly, but not least, um, this is um, something that is um, absolutely beautiful. We have with us today two wonderful uh, human beings, beautiful Christians, that are trying to do something um, good for the church. Uh, they come from a, um, a, a beautiful background uh, in, in finance. Um, 
and that is Clem and Virginia. They're with, both with us. They'll be later on sitting in the foyer area. There's a table for them. Now, let me just say a couple of words about them. Clem and Virginia, uh, experienced brokers, mortgage consultants, uh, with over 25 years combined. Office located in Northwest Sydney. Um, they are members and long-term brokers working with the church, looking to raise funds for the church. So they are, help, are trying to help the church. In which way? All proceeds from settled loans will be donated back to the church. So if you are applying for a loan, you go and see Clem and Virginia. Um, if the loan goes ahead and it's settled, their money that, which they receive for that settled loan, uh, they are giving it back all to the church. So it's a 100% donation back to the church. Can you please put your hands together for Clem and Virginia? If you are interested uh, or know someone needing a loan, please reach out to Clem and Virginia. They'll be sitting in the foyer area after the Bible preach. Uh, brochures are available and, and stand outside for any questions you may have. Um, also, I'm calling out for all the professionals in related fields such as accountants, solic solicitors, real estate agents, medical professionals. If anybody wishes to support this great, great, great cause, if you are a doctor, if you are an accountant, um, if you are a lawyer, a solicitor, a real estate agent, uh, uh, you can be a source of referral to Clem and Virginia. Refer clients to them, they'll write the loan, and those pro proceeds will go back to the church. Uh, so please, we need everyone's help here, because whatever proceeds come back to the church, I can assure you, for as long as I live, for as long as the Lord keeps this bishop standing on his feet, I can assure you, every penny is going to go to helping people. This I sign with my own blood. I sign with my own blood. Every penny will go to helping people that are in absolute need. We don't boast about it. We don't blow the trumpet and tell all the time. But let me tell you, there has been a lot of occasions, what we haven't mentioned it, that it was a life-saving operations. Money needed immediately for an operation to go through to save someone's life, and we've done it. We've, we've pulled it. We've pulled it through. Um, and only a couple of days ago, a nine-year-old boy, his life was saved for an urgent operation overseas. We sent the money on the spot, no questions asked. They send us all the information, all the details. We check these things thoroughly. They are absolutely genuine cases. This I can shout for, I can stamp seal it. They send us the, the pictures, the young boy, after the operation, fully recovered. He was dying. He was dying. He was literally dying. He had, he had a couple of days. That's it. If the operation was not done, he would have been dead. He's fully recovered now. We thank the Lord. So when we help Clem and Virginia in supporting this great cause, we can help more people that are in absolute desperate need out there, whether in Australia or abroad. So please, afterwards, see Clem and Virginia for more information. Thank you so much. God bless you, and may the Lord be with you always. Let us stand for the finale prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen. May the Lord Jesus bless you, guide you and protect you all the days of your life, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. The peace of Christ be with you always. God bless.